Y'all, welcome back to Kentucky Fraud Wargaming, where two guys who aren't qualified to talk about anything decide to talk about a game with hard math and chat. I'm Joe. And I'm John. And John's bobbing his head like he does his intro, but uh, he doesn't. And I'm very aware of this fact. Well, I, I have to pantomime against you. It's like Duel the Fates, but for podcast intros. Good lord. Our vanguard, who we play Conquest with, knows our intro. And you don't. God, nutty. Um, today, uh, no we're coming back for the first uh, podcast episode. We've put out a lot of lore stuff lately in a minute. Because uh, really, we want to take some time to address a a topic that has been buzzing in the community a lot lately. Got people, uh, in some cases, real angry. In some cases, just overwhelmingly confused. Uh, and when that happens, instead of sort of jumping in on it uh, to like throw gasoline on the fire, because let's be honest, it don't need no more. Um, instead, we'd like to come back to help folks who are, uh, especially like us, uh, of the more casual lean, who don't follow these games religiously, to understand what's happening when you might not have seen it before. Uh, and in this case, is that's indexes. Uh, it's a lot of talk about it lately, coming in from all across the internet, you hearing it a lot from Age of Sigmar, uh, because of some announcements that Games Workshop has made. And I see the question posed over and over again, what are indexes and why are people so mad about them? And uh, mm -hmm. we thought it was worth it to at least try to talk about it and help. Yeah, I think like it's a tough topic to talk about indexes in any any game um, because there's a, like an, an inherent negative connotation to it built up after like a long time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we're probably going to address some of that here, but like, I think it's important to sort of go into it with expectations if your goal is to still enjoy and play the games. Mm -hmm. At least you can be armed like with some knowledge. Yeah, like I think like from the get-go, it's sort of important to be like, do you want to keep playing? Yes? Okay, then you have to like sort of set, a, sort of set expectations. Uh, if you don't want to play or you want to take a break, then just maybe don't pay attention mm -hmm. for a bit. Yeah. And I think that decision is hard to make if you don't understand what you're choosing or not choosing. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we do our best to break it down. But first, we've got to talk about hobby time and games play. Hi, right, John. What you been up to? Mm -hmm. uh, so hobby-wise, I've done a lot of building. I've done a lot of painting. Um, built more Hundred Kingdoms. Uh, built more world leaders, uh, built more terrain stuff, printed more pieces for terrain, a um, whole lot of that stuff. But uh, I'm about to enter what I'm going to call my week of colossal painting, as I have some time off work and I'm going to spend most of it painting, mm -hmm. including some of it being for like um, a competition piece, um, which is just a really not competitive paint job I'm going to do. Uh, I'm just going to just try really hard on a single miniature um, as an excuse to just like really push outside the like my, the normal box I put myself in and not really compare myself to anyone else. Just sort of see how much I can put into a model in the course of like a day. Mm -hmm. Just try to go really, really hard for a day where I just got like no time pressure or anything. Just paint it really hard. Um, but games, we played a ton of games. Good God, we truly have. Uh, since last talking, I'm pretty sure we have had, like, I have played, like, seven or eight games of Conquest. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've played about the same amount. We have often yeah. played in the same space. Uh, I've played both Hundred Kingdoms and Wadroon. I've played Hundred Kingdoms into Old Dominion. I've played Wadroon into Dwegum. Old Dominion and Hundred Kingdoms, uh, and we had a North and, game and Norths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like I've played a bunch of Woodrin, and uh, I've officially ordered my Tontor, and we'll like be continuing down the path of Woodrin, learning how to play the army really well. Um, and sort of we've got we've got a much better grasp of Conquest now, and we'll be talking more about Conquest in the future. But mm -hmm. today is not that. Yeah, uh, kind of pivoting back. But yet, yeah, for me, it's been similar. Uh, a lot of games. So many games played. Um, really, like, cranking out the Nords because of the League. It's, like, been a minute since we did a podcast episode. So it's just been, like, a couple of weeks. 
Uh, and we finished up the league. We've had a couple of impromptu game nights where we played for like almost the entirety of the day, late, late into the night in some cases. Uh, so getting a lot of games in under the belt, which has been really great. Uh, and then in my hobby time outside of playing, uh, I've been doing a ton of building. Uh, I built the entirety of the starter box for Dwegum, like the new supercharged starter set. Uh, I also built the entirety of the First Blood starter set and everything inside of there. Uh, and I've also been 3D printing and building some Tau, uh, which all got put together. Uh, I painted two of those broadsides that I printed and built. Uh, so I also got some painting done. And uh, it's just been a lot. It's been fun. Uh, it's sort of like I'm in, I'm at the end of the long, long push that was the, uh, the deep winter hobby surge. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now I feel like I'm kind of coming out the other side and I'm just sort of, I'm at a crossroads of how I'm going to reassess and choose a new direction. And I haven't quite picked where I'm going to go yet. But, um, yeah, it's felt good to just like diligently work away on fun little hobby projects all winter. Which for me is like a, yeah. a thing I try to look forward to every year. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think a lot of it's going to be uh, just like hobbying away on some more Conquest. I might start painting some Dwegum just to see how it goes on like full units after my little tester mini. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe buy a little bit more Dwegum. I don't know. We'll see how things shake out. And uh, also maybe continue to paint up on some Tau. Uh, I know I'm going to have to do a terrain piece here in the next couple of months, but currently I'm sort of uh, waiting until uh, the person I commissioned to print it for me is done. So I've got a, a couple of weeks where I'm sitting idle. It's always hard to figure out how you're going to use it. Uh, yeah, it's always difficult to be like, I did a whole bunch of stuff and I want to do more, but I don't know how I'm allowed to do. Like, what, do I, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. I'm going to artificially create stuff for myself to do, or am I just going like, to sit here? But if I sit here, then I don't know if I want to do more stuff later. I don't know. Uh, my answer has been like, hey, I'm going to read more books. Which like, it's mm -hmm. a fine answer. I love reading. Uh, just, it's weird to be like, huh, it's hobby time normally. I guess I'm going to go read Legends of the Five Rings short stories? That's, yeah, that's fine. It's hobby. <laughs> I don't know if that's hobby, but sure, that's hobby. I'll count it as hobby. Uh, normally, I'd probably be like pivoting to uh, hobby up some more Age of Sigmar stuff, but with Index is coming, uh, that sometimes can be a little hairy. Yeah, we're going to get into that now. Play the music. All right, John. We have to give the disclaimer at the top. The vaunted important disclaimer. Mm -hmm. We are recording this episode towards the end of March. Yes. Gabe's Workshop has not laid out their entire plan for indexes. So we only we know watched, what we know. We watched the stream uh, on Wednesday or Thursday, whenever it was, late that night. Uh, we let our thoughts sit for a couple of days before responding, and we talked about it for many uh, an hour, and talked to multiple other people, and got a bunch of other opinions Really thought about it and read everything GW has said so far um, before coming to talk about it. Uh, we are trying to not be reactionary. So as like a disclaimer, this is what we think is a pretty balanced, but probably uninformed opinion, which is way before there is any information for it. Yeah. Um, from the, the reveals at Adepticon, it seems like they're trying to pl uh, hold a lot of stuff pretty close to the chest. Mm -hmm. uh, so truly... We do not know all the pieces. If we knew everything that was coming, I think people would be uh, less nervous about it in the community. Uh, and I think how close they're trying to play it to their chest is working against them in this case. Because uh, mm -hmm. folks just don't know what to expect. Because there is some mm -hmm. history with indexes that uh, have been a little difficult. And that's why I think we should start this. Is like If you're a person mm -hmm. who is uh, hearing about indexes, in Age of Sigmar 4th edition for the first time, and you're going, what the hell's an index? And why is everyone up in arms? We should probably talk about just like briefly what an index is. And then secondarily, what are the history? And uh, yeah. for me, it's very simple. Like an index is a 
simplified, collated, now entirely digital set of holdover rules that they hand out so that they can fully reset a system from the ground up. And like slowly release battle times. Um, I think a good touchstone if you've been playing this for a long time since fantasy time is that what it's not is it's not a hard, complete destruction of a system and then a refreshing of a new one. Like this isn't like the change from Warhammer Fantasy to Age of Sigmar. This is like a change from Warhammer 7th edition to 8th edition or Warhammer 9th edition to Warhammer 10th edition of like 40k, Mm -hmm. right? Like this, the game will still look relatively the same. But there are probably going to be significant changes. And ultimately, this is a reason for GW to start restart the Games Workshop Battle Tome treadmill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it isn't going to be them deleting whole armies just like off the rip. Whatever army you are playing in Age of Sigmar today, you will still be playing come 4th edition. That's not a thing that you got to worry about. It just really comes General. down to what is it going to look like and that... No one's going to be able to say. Uh, Yes. So let's look at the history and why some people might be uh, a little hesitant. Because you might be confused to like why everyone's even up at arms about this acknowledgement if armies are getting deleted off the rip. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's largely because this ain't the first time this has happened. Uh, The first time I know of Games Workshop doing this with 8th edition. Was there actually any before that, John? Because I didn't start uh, until no. the index is an eighth. So, like, that was my first no. experience with Warhammer. No, not really. So, like, the concept of index was first, like, in a in White Dwarves, where, like, you would have an army that you that would, like, exist in the lore, or there's, like, a sub-faction for another army, that they would give index rules for you to have expanded versions of being able to play that as a larger force, um, as, like, optional extra stuff. But it wasn't ever called, like, a real army. And that got expanded during the release of 8th edition um, because the jump from 7th edition to 8th edition 40k was so colossally large. It's probably one of the largest edition shifts for any of the GW games they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did it at a time where they GW still didn't really believe in digital anything when it came to rules or like changes. They still did almost like that's when points were still printed in books not online. Mm-hmm. That's when like they didn't have digital war scrolls for AOS for the most part. Like, they didn't have almost anything. It was they were still, like, believing everyone bought paper books. Um, and so, back then, it was broken up into, like, Xenos 1, Xenos 2, Imperial 1, Imperial 2, yeah. Chaos 1, Chaos 2. And they were, like, $35, $40 books that had no art in them and were just stat blocks mm-hmm. for whole, like, for whole armies. Uh, um, and, like, yeah. there were clustered of armies in each book. It wasn't even, like, the Tau would get a book. It's, like, no, the Tau, Tyranids... And Gene Zircholtz, all my, but in a book with maybe orcs. And then like... Zedos 1 and then Zedos 2 with all the Eldar. Yeah, I remember trying to get a hold of my... uh, I think Zedos 2 had the Tyranid book in it. And that's what I was trying to get a hold of so I could play. Uh, But I couldn't find it anywhere locally. They sold Mm -hmm. out because it was all physical books. Um, So the edition dropped and I was told like, yeah, you need to go buy this little like pamphlet magazine thing to be able to play your army. I'm like, okay, where do I buy that? Like, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Like, <laughs> how do people play this game? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the answer was I actually didn't get to play for a bit after the edition dropped because no one here could get the the indexes. Yeah, because they stopped selling them after a bit because um, they just didn't want to spend the money on stocking it, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it... That might just be like a US thing or maybe just a regional thing to me. But uh, around here, it certainly put a bad taste in people's mouth because they just couldn't get a hold of them. Uh, Really, the saving grace was that uh, people started to share pictures of their index stuff online. Mm-hmm. So even if you couldn't get a hold of your index book, if you could find these like Imgur galleries of pictures, you could still play. It was a little janky, but you could play. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I... And it's also probably worth noting that these index rules were like the lightest they ever did for rules. Like, I'm talking, like, your army rules would be, like, two sentences, maybe. You would get max, get three spells per army, and then, like, you would have stat sheets. And each stat sheet was, like, a, a, a extremely small. It was maybe an ability if you were lucky. There wasn't, like, universal special rules or anything. Like, it was very bare bones, and to be honest, not very good 
like uh, there were, and there was a lot of gaps. I think one, like the one of the most notorious ones at the time was like you could run like three hundred guardsmen in conscripts because of the way it was worded, and then you could just swarm the board with bodies, and your opponent couldn't actually do enough damage to kill all of them. Mm-hmm. And like that only existed for like a month before it got changed, but it was still like not good. Mm-hmm. I do remember it's there being the some Wild balance West. issues. <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot of balance yes. issues. Um, yeah. Yeah, once we were able to actually get the books and started getting into it, I remember many of the armies played pretty well into each other, but there were some very uh, targeted problems that we had to handle, uh, sort of like locally in the playgroup. Uh, and I think the the combination of not being able to buy them and then also having issues once you did left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Um, mm-hmm. As did, like, if you were playing in 7th edition and then you got reset to 8th, a lot of people felt like it was oversimplified. Now, granted, at the time, I was new, so that meant nothing to me. But uh, I certainly well, could feel some of the struggles. So as someone who played 7th edition and went to 8th edition, like, 8th edition felt like it was a better edition to, like, uh, just kind of sit and play with your butts. But it did suck that, like, a lot of the good stuff at the end of 7th edition that was fun, like... uh New codexes like Corn Demonkin got deleted, don't exist. All of the like stuff for Thousand Sons and Night Lords and like all the sub faction stuff deleted doesn't exist. Um, and like factions that are released at the end there, like Gene Slayer Colts at the end of Seventh Edition, their index rules were so bad they were unplayable until they got a codex. Not just like, oh, you're going to struggle a little bit. Like the army no longer played at all, like how it was originally released. And back then they had even less models than they do now. And, like, you physically could not play the army. Mm-hmm. Like, it was it was painful. Um, and when people were playing, like, some people in 7th edition were still using older codexes before the 8th edition release. And those older codexes were, like, $35, $40 at the time. So the idea of buying a $35, $40 book for a faction for holdover rules was kind of painful for people as well. Mm-hmm. On top of, this is when they released Primaris Marines, which made a lot of people who played Marines go, so you just invalidated my rules, you invalidated my actual army with a new army. What? Yeah, it it kind of put people up at arms and defensive from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Which has, like, a lot of that sounds you're like, oh, well, what do you mean Primaris Marines were an issue? Like, they were, and it's a lot of those feelings that a lot of the community had kind of trickled down over the years into every time they do indexes or a rules release. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, I think honestly though, like eighth was a little rough. Uh, but honestly, I think a lot of this, the up at armsness feels like it is coming from the 10th edition release of 40 K, which <laughs> was more recent, which is probably why it's more in people's mind. Um, so recently, 40K went from 9th edition to 10th edition. And if you're someone who plays 40K, you know about this. I apologize. Bear with me a minute. Um, but if you don't play 40K, they did a big addition change. They took all the core rules, they deleted them, and they rewrote them from the ground up. And they redesigned a lot of the systems in the game and how they worked. For example, mm-hmm. they changed how magic works entirely. They pulled the psychic phase out of the game altogether. How you score points. They changed it entirely. They pulled it out. They rewrote the secondaries altogether. How how uh, terrain and cover work. They deleted it entirely. They rewrote it from the ground up and did a new iteration. Uh, uh, how you built armies. Again, deleted it completely out and rewrote it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they also did universal keywords. So a lot of the abilities and stuff on War Scrolls had to be rewritten. So they deleted them all and rewrote them from the ground up. Uh, and what And as they started to change a lot of those core systems, essentially what they decided to do is that they need to nuke all of the rules, all of them, and rewrite them all. All the war scrolls, all the armies, all the army rules, and the core rules. Uh, And to do that, they indexed. So everybody's books are invalid. Mm -hmm. Deleted. Can't play them anymore. And then they released, this time, not physical books, which is very much a huge improvement in my opinion like colossal improvement. So they released PDFs so you can get them digitally Mm -hmm. and you could download them from the website. And that was great for free. And I will say, I think having played both, right. 
both indexes of 8th edition and 10th edition. I think the 10th edition indexes are a step forward. Mm -hmm. They are better. They are like nice. They're they're good enough rules for free. For for instance, like it's very good rules for free. Um, and like I play world eaters, and I still want to play world eaters with the rules that I have. I play guard. I still want to play guard with the rules that I have. Um, but some factions don't have that um, because they did sort of release with a lack of options. Mm-hmm. Um. But I think like a big thing between the two of them that is different with the releases is that what happened after the indexes came out, right? Which causes a lot of tribulation within the community. In 8th edition, as codexes were being released from indexes, the codexes were so astronomically more powerful than index books that whenever you were playing a codex versus an index faction, the codex faction almost always won. Like historically, because there was just way more power in the book. And this led to constant conversations about power creep and how they were releasing new books that were getting categorically more powerful compared to the book behind it. Yeah. And so you would see like book came out, the next book was more powerful. Book came out, next book was more powerful. And for index index factions who didn't even get a book yet at all, we're like, so we're just going to keep being underpowered compared to these new books. And that built, like, put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. And though ninth edition was not an index edition, it did the same thing with its books for the most part, which then perpetuated this idea that whenever a battle tome comes out, we're going to have a more powerful faction and deal with it. Um, but so far from 10th edition, what has been different is that that has been mostly not the case. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot less power creep. There's been more options and there has been like th- like some like outliers, but most of the codexes that have come out have shaken the, air quotes, meta, a little bit, but not so astronomically that you don't see index factions performing. Uh, I mean, Custodians don't have a book yet. They're still doing well. Elder don't have a book yet. They're still doing well. World Leaders don't have a book yet. They're still doing well. We're in a pretty balanced state in competitive 40k, which is good. And half of the armies don't have books. Mm-hmm. right? So that, that does show a level of success with this rollout, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah which I like. Uh, honestly, the fact that it's digital and I don't have to pay money for it and I don't have to try to find it is just a colossal improvement for me. Um, I love that a whole lot. Uh, for me, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are, uh, down on the indexes because some of the factions are very restrictive and you don't have Mm -hmm. list building options, uh, which means people figured out their army index quickly, uh, and Mm-hmm. Some of the army rules are very, very restrictive on what they give you any bonuses for. And when that happens, you're only going to be able to get bonuses on a handful of your war scrolls. And everything else is kind of left in the dust. And you don't have flexibility to list build or tinker. Uh, and that has left a lot of people kind of like twiddling their thumbs going, how long do I have to wait before I get to mm-hmm. build a second list? And the answer to and- that could be... Two and a half years. Yes. And then get a book and six months later you have to do it all over again. Yeah, because that's the second thing for 10th that made a lot of people real unhappy is that there were some books like uh, World Eaters or Guard that Mm -hmm. got released at the end of 9th edition and then were valid for about four months and then got deleted. So if you played those armies, you spent $60 for... Four months of game, and then they're worth next to nothing. And that's rough. Yep. It's happening to me right now in Age of Sigmar with Flesh Eater Courts. Yeah, and what, what makes it worse is that, like, especially with 10th edition, where they've gone more digital, oftentimes these books are coming out currently for 10th edition with rules that are invalid as soon as the book is physically on shelves and a full physical release without a special edition release or FOMO box. Just like can buy just the book off the shelf. The points are invalid in the book, which they tell you that you can go find the points for free online. That's fine. Just take the points out of the book at that point, please. But also, like oftentimes the rules have had at least a somewhat like minor change. Right? So like these, it, it leaves me questioning why even do a physical release for these books and not just a one-time physical release, but a staggered release where you ha- release special edition versions and then also full physical versions. Mm-hmm. 
it's sort of like what we're in a weird transitionary period. It seems with their business model where they haven't, they don't want to give up the books, the book revenue, but they realize that that's not gonna, it, it isn't conducive to their marketing currently. Yeah. So they're sort of rock and hard place. Um, yeah. And largely from my perspective, those are the big events that have made people hesitant to deal with codexes again. Mm-hmm. And the trepidation in the 40K space is leaking over into Age of Sigmar right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they people don't know if they're going to have to deal with these same challenges, these same struggles. Uh, and that has made some people a little wild, a little angry. Um, and if you weren't here to see those things happen, you probably just don't understand it all or even have the context. And hopefully mm-hmm. that at least arms you a little bit with the history. Um and now that we've sort of like laid that foundation, let's talk about sort of like the, uh, let's get down to like brass tacks about it. Like, what do we know is actually coming? Because we don't know a lot, as we said. They have not revealed their full plan. I think if they did, it mm, would help no. people to chill a little. But they're really trying to like hot, play a lot of this close to the chest, probably so they can leak it out over time to get like Warhammer community articles for the next few months. Um, and like it doesn't it doesn't help that they released more information in their actual written article talking about it than in their live stream that people watched. Mm-hmm. Um, because like in the live stream that they want like that they announced it in, we didn't see any models for their launch box or basically anything for fourth edition. We just had some guys talking about it, and all they said was weapon rangers are going away and we're indexing your stuff, and some stuff is changing. And they nested some of what they want to do in a bunch of buzzwords that if you don't, if you're not like super paying attention, you're not going to pick up on, Mm -hmm. Um, which leaves it very ambiguous and doesn't lead any sort of confidence into just seeing what happens. Um, But as I was saying, they, they did release more stuff in like an actual article, right? So articles linked below. Big key. Yes. Articles linked below in its entirety if you want to go read yeah. it. I recommend you do very, very strongly. And like what we know they have said on stream and in the article that is changing, right, is that we are going to have War Scroll stats completely reevaluated. That means wounds, that means movement, that means weapons and damages, that means all the stuff, right? So even though you have two wound Stormcast right now or like Orcs and Gut Rippers, you might not have that going forward. Those things might change, right? What we know is like baseline stats for things might change. Their referencing for that was this concept of three pillars of like what you expect to be on the table and playing, what mechanically is fun, and what fits the narrative, mm-hmm. right? And those three things all they, they feel like need to be represented within the rules, right? Um, the next thing is that we're going to have universal special rules. Their example they used was standard bearers. So like, or champions or champions, right? Standard barrier banners or champions will just do a thing across the entire game and it will be put in one place. Like this is what standard bears are. This is what champions do. They have not stated how far that goes. It could just be. That's the case for champions and standard bears and things like that. That could include, uh, abilities that are very shared across all factions. Um, that could be, that's all of the special rules that you get to see. You don't know. Um, I know that in 10th edition, 40k they they did sort of a most things are special rules but there's still some special rules on cards on war scrolls you are more unique rules. that's the way i would describe yes. that like most things are uh universal special rules but you know you still get some unique bonuses they're just more rare i expect which i i would bet that that's what they're going to do with age of sigmar but can't guarantee I, it um the other thing they said is that they are going to have every war scroll they said would be we fit on one page. There will be one page war scrolls, even complicated models. We will see at how to how true that is, what it will look like. We, we do, there's no context, right? Yeah, I ex- just a thing they said. For me, like I like the gods jump to mind, like Nagash, Alariel, uh, big big units like that that have like a bajillion special rules underneath them. Those are the ones that I really want to see how they squeeze them down. Um, We'll see. Uh, my expectation is that they will 
do that via special abilities, like universal special rules. You will just see a laundry list of universal special rules on those god characters to make them unique, and then one or two abilities on their actual sheet. Mm -hmm. um, then the other thing is that command points and abilities are staying, but they're changing. Just don't know, we don't know why, how, yeah, or, or what. They're changing the system from the ground up of how command points are generated and used. Um, Which is pretty par for the course with addition changes. Yeah, that's one of those things that like you keep going back to the drawing board on. Because uh, mm -hmm. it's so core to the game. Uh, you want to refine that every time. It's one of the things that every army interacts with in one way or another. So that doesn't surprise me. We don't know how they're mm -hmm. changing it exactly, but they're changing it. Uh, and then what is staying, right? Uh, what's staying is battle traits, sub factions, enhancements, spell lores, war scrolls, the priority turn roll, uh, and regiments and armies of renown will stay, but will be changed. So all the stuff from Dawnbringers have, has came out to make unique armies, like for the dragons, for Trog's Trog Herd, those are also going to be playable. They will just be updated in the new edition. Yeah. Um, so like what that says is that a lot of the stuff you are still using right now will still be there. To what degree, we don't know. But this does sound like they are bringing more of the actual like individual army stuff that is like identifiable mm -hmm. forward into the edition than they have when they've done indexes for 40k. Yeah, because I do think a lot of the 40k guff is because they cut out so much that you didn't have mm -hmm. options. Uh, and especially for me, the armies of Renown is the one that I look at and go... Mm, that's telling. Like, if yeah. you're porting over the armies of Renown, you have to go pretty deep down the rabbit hole in terms of your rules rewrite. Uh, so hopefully yeah. that holds true. Um, yeah. But between their article and also their discussion from the live stream, what really, uh, what really I'm gleaning out of this is that largely they feel like the game has become cumbersome over multiple editions due to multiple additive layers without a large revision on any of those. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, from first to second edition, they added a lot of mechanics to make the game more engaging, to make the game more fun. Uh, and then throughout second, they added more. And then through, you know, through third, more. Um, and all of those have made it more engaging, but they've also made it more difficult to play they've made it more complicated to play they've made it more interactions uh that are difficult to parse some of them having unintended cascading consequences that had to be hot patched or faq'd uh and essentially they're kind of like tripping over their own feet on like this spaghetti code as a good analogy so they just mm -hmm. want to reset from the ground up and get a chance to uh take a crack at stuff that they haven't gotten to change yet and that's their yeah. goal. Yeah, I think that is the like that's a good summary of like what I think is going to happen. Um, but I think going forward, right? If you're a player of these games, you've invested a ton of money, a ton of time, a ton of effort into building and painting and playing this game for years. Especially if you started in like AOS one or maybe AOS two, and you're like scared about. What does this mean for playing the game going forward for me? Is that you can set some expectations, um, which like that's what we're doing, right? Setting expectations for ourselves rooted with the idea that we still want to play the game. We want to enjoy it. So like what can we do with the knowledge that we're knowledge that we're armed with before they start releasing more information so that when we are looking at it, we're looking at it from a lens of like, does this match what I'm wanting out of the game? Or is it changing in a way that I don't like and can I flex with it? Mm-hmm. Because I think that's the right. mindset, right? Like, I think a lot of people kind of get, like, wrapped up in the angry goblin noises of it all. And I get it. I, I do. I really do. Um, but for us here on this channel and in this community and reading the comment section, like, really, y'all out there want to enjoy the games you like. That's mm -hmm. the whole goal. Like, that is the... <laughs> that is primary objective one. Um... And in that case, instead of making like angry goblin noises, I think it is far more helpful to that goal to just try to engage with expectations. Yeah, and so I'll start with my, my expectations of what I think the indexes coming out will be like. Uh, and 
like what my response to this news is basically going to be. Um, and so like my expectations is that we're going to see a complete reshaping of War Scrolls and I will have to like readjust what I think each unit and what model does. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll use like Slaves Dark as an example for myself. Like a Chaos Warrior might not be the same sort of thing that I see it as now. It may change. Same thing with my Knights or same thing with my like Varying Guard. They are all going to be different. Um, that is my expectation going forward. So I'm not going to hold any expectation that what they're, where they're currently at is where they're going to continue being. Um, but I think that overall, this sort of like gives an opportunity for them to fix some of the like lesser known problems or like lesser talked about issues in the game. For instance, like Liberators or like a lot of the Stormcast problem mm -hmm. in general, where almost all of the Stormcast feels very samey and you're sort of picking very slight alterations between War Scrolls. Um, Liberators, for instance, I have two wounds and I have a four up armor save, three up if they have shields. That's not exactly like the bastion against the darkness. Like, yes. The but anvil the, against the, chaos. <laughs> they're supposed to be like this extremely tough group of five man dudes who just are impossible to die. And by the time they've died, they've saved you enough time to like complete whatever objective you had. It don't work. They that. are slightly cheaper than gut rippers who do their job about the same. Yeah. Yeah. Who are supposed to be sneaky, stabby orcs. It's a, who have the same wounds in them at two wounds, have a slightly worse armor save at five up, but they're also minus one to hit in melee with the scare shields. So, like... Yeah, the stats don't match the fluff. I love the, or, I love the fantasy. I love the origin mm -hmm. of the Liberators. I think their job needs to be done. And they're so mm -hmm. cool. They're like the foundation of a good list for a lot of people. But th mm -hmm. the stats just don't match. But, hey, a, a, a stat redesign from the ground up is a time when you can maybe make that adjustment. I don't think yeah. they should, like, in this case, I don't think they're going to, like, crank their armor save fire, but, like, give them an extra wound per dude. Yeah. That could be helpful. Stuff like that, yeah. I think, is going to happen a lot. Yeah, like, slight changes, but are very impactful, right? Like, a, a readjustment that maybe not every Stormcast dude has two wounds. Maybe some of them have three, and maybe some of them are lightly armored and have one. Um, maybe some have four. Maybe some are just absolute beefcakes. Like, right. Uh, you know, and then the other, like the other big expectation I have, um, that I sort of, maybe it's wishing for the best. And that is a kind of twofold, which is army construction and secondary objectives slash primary objectives, like playing the missions and building the armies, I think fundamentally has to change. I think that the current expectation when I sit down to build an AOS list, especially when I compare it to other fantasy games, is that I have to spend twice as long with tedious paperwork parts of it instead of picking units I think are going to be cool together and synergize well. Mm -hmm. Like I instead have to like figure out how to make battalions work with it, but also how am I engaging with my battle tactics and how am I engaging with my grand strategy? And why does this matter more than just playing the primary? Why are most of the primaries seem so like weird and as like a weird backdrop to mostly just doing like secondaries? And like why does this feel so rote to play this faction game and game and game and game? Because like the secondaries are the thing that I build towards instead of like building a list to play up ever shifting primary mission. Um which, like, I think that has to change. And that is my expectation, is that that will completely be deconstructed and recreated from the ground up. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that's going to look like, but it, uh, it's got to happen. Like, like, <laughs> you could yeah, tack uh, that from just, like, an infinitesimal number of directions to rewrite that system. But I certainly think, I agree, I'm going to call the Babe Ruth shot. That's changing. Yeah, and if, if they, they've said this change is mostly focused on trying to make it easier for new people to get into AOS. And I think that's one of the biggest roadblocks. I don't think it's it's necessarily individual army rules or individual like unit rules. It's that you have to learn all that, but then you also have to learn like six tertiary systems in order to play the game effectively, and all of them kind of suck to engage with. Like none of them feel rewarding. They feel like tedious bookwork. Yeah, I feel like the grand strats are probably okay. They're not usually too complicated. They're kind of fluffy, especially no. out of the core, especially out of like army books. Okay, that's yeah. fine. But the battle mm -hmm. tactics are so hard to explain to new players. Uh, mm -hmm. It's rough. It's real rough. I mean, hell, it's why uh, we were going to run before I got the COVID and uh, had to cancel the event because my wife and I were both Typhoid Mary. Um, 
we were going to run an event for Age of Sigmar uh, here this past February, and for us, we had to write a whole beginner-friendly battle pack from the ground up that cut out all of the battle tactics that they put out and replaced them with super simple ones that were easier to implement because the core rules were too complicated for our newer players to follow in any reasonable way uh, on top of the current General's Handbook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we we did that to help our new players, and I think the game designers are seeing similar friction from their perspectives as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I having tried to show at least four or five new people Age of Sigmar this year alone, it is the thing that is the most difficult for them. It's like uh, learning the game is difficult enough, but then also having to learn all these other systems. It just becomes information overload, and then the game's not fun anymore. And the game's about like dragons fighting demons. Like it should be cool as hell. <laughs> like come on, we like, we got giants fighting tiny little angry rat men. Like, we can have so much more fun with this than, like, uh, so I did the same battle tactic I've done on every one of my turn twos for the last seven games. And uh, that means that I got a two-point lead on you. And uh, because you didn't get your battle tactics for three turns, uh, you cannot win this game. You tabled me, but it doesn't matter. I win. I talked to the moon for three turns. Like, what a fun game we've played. I mean, I guess it depends on how you talk to the moon. Is it like a bear in the big blue house song sort of situation? Or like... What? No. Is it like an Avatar The Last Airbender romance situation? No, I just got to pick that it sits in the center of the table, uh, which means I guarantee my points every time I want to for this turn. This is the worst it's the moon. the most optimal term to do it on. Yeah, this is like the worst moon interaction, job. Like, it's yeah. terrible. It is the worst moon interaction for a faction that is like, inc like I'm going on a slight tangent here, but like Gloom's White Gits is a beautiful, wonderful faction full of like the most random manic rules of like bonkers, crazy lore. And they have battle tactics that are just like very rote and not necessarily fun to play with uh, or fun to play against because they just don't like much like when you play Skaven or like any of the bonkers factions, what makes them fun is the randomness and how the game can spike big or spike low and like these huge highs and huge lows that are super fun. And the battle tactics could have been that, but they were not. Um, there was no high risk, high reward sort of deal. So Ludo narrative dissonant, which we should just do an episode on. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe maybe we should. Maybe we should. I think <laughs> maybe we should. Uh, applicable to a lot of games. So, like, okay, if those are what your expectations are, that you, like, ex essentially your expectations are to have few expectations for, like, your units and your armies, and a lot of stuff is going to change from the ground up. Like, what is your plan of reaction? Like, what's your battle strategy? Not your battle tactic. Battle tactic, bad word. What's your battle strategy? <laughs> Uh, so for me, it's really simple. Uh, it is the same thing I do with every time an edition changes. Um, because like GW has created this marketing treadmill that essentially tells me around Adepticon when they're announcing a new edition is to stop buying their stuff for six or seven months. Um, and to almost not play their game because it won't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not great. Um, but like my reaction is to not be like a crazy person and burn all of my dark elves in a, in a bonfire. Um, but it's instead to just <laughs> not buy rule books, um, not buy their campaign books of like Dawnbringers and stuff, because like, we know what the narrative is going to be. Um, maybe find the narrative if I want to, but like the rules aren't going to be very playable or long-term playable. For me, it's a uh, um, Doug from two plus tough exists and I will just go to Doug Vaunted storyteller, Doug. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then for model buying and even model painting, I'm only going to build and paint models that I find aesthetically pleasing or very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I like the new Atraxia model for Slaves of Darkness. I really like the new Dark Oath stuff. I will probably try to get both of those uh, simply because I like the way they look and I think they would be fun in my collection. Has nothing to do with rules. There's not calculated in it whatsoever. There is no discussion around rules because all of that changes. In six months. Oh, yeah. Or not even. Like four. Like four. Four months. That changes. Um, 
and for me, like a lot of the wind of playing Age of Sigmar is sort of out of my sails. Mm-hmm. We really want to play it for four months. If someone asks to play a game, absolutely I want to play a game. If you want to like send off the edition in a cool, fun way, absolutely. But I'm not out here wanting to like buy new forces or getting new armies or like trying out new stuff. I will play the same stuff I've been playing. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of just wait for more information on the edition. Uh, and then as more information comes out, I can sort of form the idea of what faction I want to play with at the beginning of 4th edition based off of how I feel about them passionately. Because I won't know the rules until it's dropped, but I will be able to understand of like, okay, so I know roughly sort of what their idea is. Does this tell me that I want to play my spiky evil knights or do I want to play my little bastard rat men or do I want to play my little bastard orcs? Mm -hmm. And just sort of then pick and run that and just have a good time with the focus of learning a new edition and having a good time. That has worked for me with 10th edition. It worked with me with 8th edition for 40k and I think it's going to work with me with ALS. Yeah, I think that is a healthier way to approach things, just generally speaking. Uh, for me, my expectations, honestly, like we share a lot of them uh, sort of just like together because we've seen this before. But for me, my big expectations are that largely uh, I'm hopeful, but I'm hesitant. Um, I like less complexity to speed up the game and to remove some cumbersome mechanics is great. And truly, I welcome it with open arms. And like we've talked about that on the show a number of times before. Uh, the game's gotten rather large over the years, and this could help to streamline some of that. Uh, however, depending on the rollout, I also worry it could end up feeling stale for me fairly quickly, uh, depending on the number of sub-factions that they put out uh, for each faction or, you know, how units are handled. And, because uh, that's partially what has happened to me for 40k indexes is I'm sort of just in a holding pattern waiting for codexes because my armies, for me, I have, like, my list figured out and there's really not a lot of flex. And I don't want that to happen here, but it's possible until we hear more. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, for me, like my big plan in the meantime is to do my best to just keep a level head, stay out of the angry frenzy that is inevitably going to happen no matter what the hell their plan is, and to adjust my expectations until we know more. Um, but I won't be buying any books, uh, and uh, I'm just going to hobby on projects that I feel are more safe and that uh, aren't going to go anywhere or aren't going to you know, be invalid or by in any way come the new edition. So for me, that means uh, Lumineth. I'm almost done with a full 2K Lumineth army for uh, Alarith. And uh, that I could finish up. I know Lumineth are going to stand up. They're going to look like Lumineth when we're done. Um, mm -hmm. And Flesh Eater Quartz. I've got, I've got over 2,000 points of Flesh Eater Quartz painted in like the past two months. Uh, but Usheron's just come out. I'm going to paint up Usheron. It's going to be safe to paint up Usheron. Usheron's not going anywhere. Uh, and then also for me, that includes terrain. Like, terrain is mm -hmm. a, uh, always a safe thing to hobby on. They're never not going to need terrain. Uh, if you want to, like, build up or print or paint terrain, you're going to find a way to use the terrain. The terrain might be used differently in the new edition. In fact, I kind of hope it ends up being more impactful. But you're going to use terrain. It's guaranteed. Yes. Um, um, which makes it always safe in uncertain times. Yeah, and like it is also important to say here that like if you don't want to engage with Andrew Sigmar until it releases and sort of take a break, maybe play other games, maybe just stop playing war games for a bit, maybe stop painting for a bit if you want to. Um, that's a perfectly valid option. Like this is an opportunity to sort of step off the treadmill for a bit mm -hmm. and make be make the decision if you want to come back onto the treadmill. Mm-hmm. Uh, like there is no, not telling people that you should just like rage quit, but it like maybe sometimes like, I know for me, it's happened in the past that taking a four month break from my game and uh, to just play other stuff before a new edition comes out made me more appreciate that game when it did release and then play it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And it made me, I was less angry, right? Uh, I think the shift from eighth to ninth edition, I didn't do that. I'm going to break at all. And I think uh, that led to me at least. Personally, during the beginning of ninth edition, sort of struggling with like playing the game at all. Um, so for me, like taking a break from Age of Sigmar is probably part of what I'm going to do. At least a couple months. Mm -hmm. Just chilling. Yeah. It's a thing. Yeah, I'm. 
I am always a proponent of if you feel the need to take a breather, take a breather and mm -hmm. uh, use that breather to reassess. Like, I, I just think that's good life advice for anything you do. So your hobbies are still hobbies. You're not just using them to, like, disassociate endlessly on the thing and be distracted, but to uh, truly think about why you enjoy the thing, to step away and enjoy other stuff in your life, and then to come back to it and be looking forward to that to keep you just in a happy, healthy headspace. If that's a thing that you feel is valuable, a new edition is a perfect time to do that. Mm -hmm. Truly, it might be the best time to do it. Yeah. Um, and I think for us, that's the key, is we want to give you a ton of information so you're armed with as much knowledge as we can give you, and then encourage you to ponder it and see what's right for you. Because we have so many people out there. Uh, Y'all, we cannot give sweeping statements of what you should do, what you shouldn't do. So instead, mm -hmm. we'd rather give you everything we can and then let you know, for example, of what we're choosing. Uh, mm -hmm. But you got to have to choose for yourself. And if you do have questions, if there's stuff you're not sure how to navigate, y'all, please feel free to reach out. Um, we are here on YouTube. You can put the comments down below. You can reach out through email. You can re uh, reach out through Instagram. Um, if you're still struggling, even after this, or you're still worried, or you still got questions, whatever that is, feel free to reach out. Um, it's a hobby and it's enjoyable for everyone. And we in no way want your game to become scary because you just don't know what's happening. Yeah. And like the final note for me, right, is that these games are based around community. These games are based around playing in a local shop with your buds or maybe people that like are your friends that come to your house and play these games, right? Or maybe you go to tournaments and you play the absolute ton of tournaments. You've got a bunch of people you talk to on Discord all the time and you get ready to go to these big events, right? This game is different for a bunch of people, but ultimately is about playing games physically in person with people as a community, right? Enjoy that, because at least at the beginning of the edition, the one thing we know, no matter what, is that there's going to be a ton of people with brand new rules. Nobody's going to have battle tomes. And for at least a couple of weeks, if you have the ability to play games, it's going to be the Wild West, and we all get to have a great time. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be nutty. Uh, and if you got the right folks, man, that can be fun. Uh, we might have a barbecue. Like <laughs> <laughs> barbecue opening day, weekend game time. Uh, that actually sounds pretty good. We did that for Tenth, and it was great. I think that should just be the new tradition for like every edition. Barbecue. They <laughs> like, keep dropping them in summer. They want me to grill out. I, I yeah. They didn't put it in the book, but I feel it. I know it. They want to get some flip flops, some board shorts, wear a, an apron. Perfect. A kiss the chef apron. Yeah, uh, not a kiss the chef apron. It's got to be a Sigmar line apron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and when 11th edition releases in precisely two years, uh, you could scratch that out and put the Emperor lied. Just yes. Sharpie. Perfect. But just keep doing that every time an edition changes. <laughs> <laughs> First thing coming to our merch store. Um, fill in the blank. Lied. But y'all, uh, that's been all of our opinions. Bonafide and Kentucky Fried. We'll see you on the next one. Sigmar lied. <laughs>